and welcome to Instrumental Wealth's Market and Economic Summary for the first quarter of 2024. My name is Matt Harbert, and I'm the Chief Investment Officer here at Instrumental Wealth. I really appreciate you all joining us as we recap what went on in the markets and the economy over the first quarter this year. This was actually a fairly quiet quarter, particularly compared to what has been going on over the past couple of years. So let's go ahead and look at how markets did over the first quarter. Nearly all global stock categories were positive in the first quarter with U.S. large cap equities outpacing all the other broad categories. This continues a trend that has been going on in equities over the past 12 months. As we can see on this chart, U.S. large cap equities have significantly outpaced U.S. small caps, international developed markets, as well as emerging markets. Unfortunately, this outperformance in U.S. large cap equities has not been broad based and continues to be driven by a handful of companies that make up the Magnificent Seven. More positively though, the latter part of March uh, is possibly indicating the beginning of a broadening out of the index. If you look at the orange line, which is the Magnificent Seven, and the light blue line, which is the remaining 493 companies in the S&P 500, you can see the spread between the two has been narrowing quite a bit. Looking at the sub-asset classes, U.S. growth continues to lead all other equities over the quarter, as well as the last 12 months. Commodities have actually turned positive over the quarter, although they do remain one of the few asset classes that are still negative for the last year. Bonds, on the other hand, were the worst performing asset class through the first quarter, as well as the trailing 12 months. This has been an unusually challenging period for bonds. Looking at this chart, you can see prior to 2021, there were only three calendar years that were negative going all the way back to 1976. However, since 2022, the bond market has been negative in two out of three of those calendar years. And the first quarter of this year is negative as well. This does make sense. If you look at rates going back 40 years, you can see they have been typically in a downward trend that, it, that entire period, which has enhanced bond, return, bond returns over that period. Although the past three years, that trend has reversed uh, with rates sharply rising, and that's created our challenging environment for bonds. Yields actually peaked last year at about 4.7% as the market started expecting the Fed to cut rates sooner than uh, initially anticipated. But in February and March, inflation actually heated back up a little bit and that put doubt on those cuts and yields resumed that upward trend. Looking at this chart, you can see how that rise in yields has impacted the bond market. So the blue line, which is, is the 10-year rate, you can see towards the end of the year that was trending downward. And the orange line, which is the bond market, you can see how you had a nice recovery given the falling rates. But this quarter, you can see that purple line is trending back up and that you can see that reflected in the bond market as it pulled back from the peak at the end of the year. So turning our attention to the U.S. economy, Fed policy remains a focal point, and it has been the key focus since inflation was spiking back in 2021 and 2022. And it's also the primary issue we've been discussing in each of our quarterly updates. Just to summarize what has happened, uh, last year the Fed completed the biggest tightening cycle in history. They hiked rates 525 basis points in just 17 months. Since then, they've left rates unchanged. The policy was intended to keep inflation from spiraling out of control once the Fed realized it incorrectly estimated inflation would be transitory. And you can see on this chart that the headline rate surged all the way up to 9% by June of 2022. And this chart shows us the effect that the rising interest rate policy has had on inflation. See, inflation has come down drastically since that peak of 2022. However, they do still remain above the 2% target set by the Fed. Interesting, however, uh, you can see that the downward trend has actually flatlined out uh, since the Fed completed their tightening cycle. So if you look at the chart, the purple and orange line is the target federal funds rate set by the Fed. And the light blue line is the headline CPI. You can see once the, uh, the hiking cycle has been completed, right around that same time, you can see how the headline rate 
has remained kind of in that three to three and a half percent range ever since. Not only has the trend flattened out, but prices have actually shown some signs of firming up over the first quarter of this year. Energy, which has been one of the areas contributing to disinflation for four consecutive months, heated back up in February and March uh, due to a surge in gas prices. Shelter, which actually makes up over 36% of the entire index, has been sticky throughout. And while there's generally a lag between a softening housing market and this component of inflation, we just haven't seen the effects here as expected and has continued to be uh, elevated. Year over year, both the headline and the core rate are well above the 2% Fed target, with the headline at 3.5% and the core at 3.8%. And these numbers actually look a little worse if you look at the three-month annualized rate, which is about 4.4% for the headline and about 4.8% for the core. We do believe there are a couple of drivers of this. Uh, one is consumer spending, and the other, which we'll touch on a little bit later, is the labor market. You can see on these charts with retail sales as the top chart and consumption, personal consumption on the bottom chart. Both of these uh, remain above their average levels. If we look a little closer at personal spending rates, you see spending did actually look like it was softening throughout 2023 even plunging all the way down to 0.1% for January of 2024. However, that spiked up in both February and March to 0.8%. And that was actually the strongest monthly rates we've had going all the way back to January of 2023. As we've talked about in the past, uh, the consumers have supported this spending habits through credit cards and savings. The orange line on here is revolving credit which is generally uh, credit cards. And the blue line is the uh, monthly savings rate. So basically we've added 125 billion in revolving credit since the beginning of 2023. And the savings rate has fallen a full 2% over the past 12 months. And while this can't be sustained long-term, the trend is likely to continue as long as consumers are confident in their employment. Essentially, as long as consumers feel their income is not at risk, they will continue to utilize these sources and spend. So that brings us to the labor market. <clears throat> the trend, you can see on this chart, is one of normalizing. It has been softening, but overall, it is still tight. There are still nearly 8.5 million jobs that companies are trying to fill. This is over 3 million more than the average number over the past 20 years. And both uh, hires as well as quits remain elevated. The economy is also continuing to add a robust amount of jobs. Over the quarter, there were over 200,000 jobs in each month, with the latest March reading at over 300,000 jobs added. And while the unemployment rate has increased slightly to 3.8%, it's still a full 1% below the average rate. We're also seeing the number of jobs available to job seekers decline, but at just under 1.5 jobs for every unemployed person, there remains ample job opportunities out there. So even with strong consumption and employment, there was a significant slowdown in the GDP growth number over the first quarter. The latest estimate was 1.6% quarter over quarter growth. That is actually the lowest rate and the first quarter that's been below 2%, going all the way back to the second quarter of 2022. So does that mean that a recession is likely on the near-term horizon? Well, we looked at consumption, and consumption would say no. But if we look at some of the indicators out there, they are mixed. The yield curve has been inverted. This is a historical predictor that once it inverts, a recession is likely over the next 18 to 24 months. And the 10 to two year portion of this curve has been inverted for 21 months. This hints at a high probability of a recession occurring sometime this year. In fact, the Estrella and Michigan Recession Probability Index, which is based on the 10 year to three month portion of the curve, is giving a high probability rate at 
58.3% that a recession will occur sometime in the next 12 months. On the other hand, the leading economic indicators, which over the last year and a half have been flashing a recession signal, have been improving, with the March reading actually pulling the index out of that recession signal. So it is no longer projecting a recession in the next 12 months. So what are some of the key takeaways uh, for the first quarter? Well, inflation. So we do expect price pressures on inflation to continue as long as consumer spending remains robust. And consumers are still using credit cards and savings uh, to fund their spending needs. We do think that the catalyst to rein in spending will be a weakening in the labor market. And in fact, the labor market is showing the trend of normalizing. However, it may take some time still to get to normal. So we may not see those impacts immediately. Finally, we may be entering, we may be just entering a period where the normal rate of inflation is closer to three or three and a half percent than the 2% we've been accustomed to since the financial crisis. With Fed policy, the Fed has stated their intent is to begin cutting rates this year. However, with inflation more persistent than expected, we should expect fewer rate cuts than has been pre previously projected. One, maybe two this year, if any. We should also expect these cuts to start a little bit later. We think it's going to be closer to the end of the year, if not waiting until 2025. In other words, we expect a scenario that rates will be higher for longer. As far as a recession, this, while the signals are mixed, we don't think that a recession is light, is the highest probability of occurring in 2024, more likely to occur in 2025. And what do we think about the markets? Well, we still do prefer U.S. equities relative to international equities, particularly U.S. large caps. We do think there are some opportunities in fixed income. While bonds have been challenged with rising rates, they are now paying high enough yields that we can be patient with them. Secondly, with rate cuts expected to begin at some point, maybe later in the year, um, that will be a big tailwind to bond returns. Now that said, we don't think it's the time for big bets. With so many uncertainties out there, with interest rates, inflation, what's going on around the world, it just we think it's better to stay diversified across several markets and that should help mitigate those risks. So this concludes the update. I hope you all enjoyed watching. And if you have any further questions for us, please feel free to reach out to us through email or our social media. Thanks again, and I hope to see you again next quarter.